Welcome to the follow-up question. I'm your host, Michael Ashford. I'm a former journalist who's now using this show to uncover amazing and insightful stories simply through asking questions, while also giving you an example of what it means to listen more than you speak so that you can become a more thoughtful and informed person. On the follow-up question podcast, I'll talk to some of the best interviewers I know to get their perspective on what it means to ask amazing questions. And I'll also interview people from all different backgrounds and perspectives who have amazing stories to tell. And I'll bring those stories to you by asking thoughtful, logical questions. So whether you're a journalist, a podcaster yourself, a blogger, someone who wants to learn how to be quick to listen and slow to speak, or someone who just likes to hear great stories, this is the show for you. Today on the show, I welcome a good friend of mine, Jesse Newell. Jesse and I go back quite a ways because we both worked together in our first job out of college. I was the sports editor at the Emporia Gazette in Emporia, Kansas, and Jesse was the sports writer. So we were a two man sports department at the Emporia Gazette in Emporia, Kansas. And he has since worked his way up through the ranks in sports writing to become now the sports beat writer for the University of Kansas for the Kansas City Star covering the University of Kansas Athletics Department. And Jesse is one of, by far, the best writers, one of the best interviewers I know, one of the best storytellers I know. And he's been named the beat writer of the year by the Associated Press Sports Editors He's been an Associated Press voter, so those polls that everybody argues with each week when they come out, when it comes to football or or basketball in college, he is one of those voters. And like I said, just an amazing storyteller. And going back to our time working together at the Emporia Gazette, I got to see Jesse's process in action, how he would craft a story, how he would approach a, an interview, how he would approach an interview subject. And I could think of no one better to discuss interviewing and asking questions and storytelling than Jesse, because I've, I've seen it and I've witnessed it firsthand just how good he is. And whether you're a writer or a journalist or not, the information that he shares in this interview is, is just phenomenal because of how good of how good of a a writer and an interviewer and storyteller he is. I think we use storytelling in so many different avenues and whether we're a podcaster or whether we're doing on a project for work, we can find ways to storytell and a lot of that starts with asking great questions and Jesse's one of the best. So, I had so much fun catching up with Jesse on this episode. It had been quite a few years since actually we had talked like this and it was just like old times like we we had uh, been working together all this time. I'm out of the journalism world now. He's, like I said, grown into it and r- risen through the ranks, and he's one of the best. We also had a chance to just talk about what life is like for a sports writer right now. Uh, when we recorded this, there were no sports going on, so what in the world is, a, is the life of a sports writer like with no sports? We got into that. Certainly, sports have started back up again, which is which I think is awesome, but you guys are going to get so many good nuggets of wisdom and perspective and insight in this conversation, and I'm excited to bring it to you here on the follow-up question. So here we go. Let's get into it. Here's my conversation with Kansas City Star beat writer, Jesse Newell. What has life been like for a sports writer who doesn't have sports to write about? <laughs> Crazy. Uh, yeah, no, it's it's difficult. It, it really is. Uh, I think what's a challenge for all of us is just kind of come up with, come up with new ideas, fresh ideas, things you can do. And um, what's going to change in the future too, is just the access, which I think for a while now, especially on the beats that I've done, you know, with colleges, the access has been limited over time compared to what we were used to. So I think already I'd sort of moved a little bit away from, Hey, you have to have this many minutes with this player to be able to write stories. And so, Hey, you go on, you, you learn more about video, you learn more about the statistics, you do different things where um, it's not requiring you to absolutely just be with somebody. And if that thing doesn't get set up by the other party that, you know, you need help from, then, you know, you can still function. And I, I think it's probably going to be huge moving forward too, just because, um, just hearing some of these protocols, if these sports happen right now, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, 
most of these interviews are going to be Zoom calls with 16 of your closest friends. So um, gone are the days of one-on-one interviews, gone are the days of, of certain things, at least for the, the time being until maybe there's a safer environment out there. But yeah, no, it's, it's, it's interesting right now. You try to continue to brainstorm. You try to create uh, different things that people are interested in. But I think it's also natural for a lot of us right now that sports aren't the first thing in mind. So you try to remain relevant while also kind of understanding that a lot of people out there have a lot of other things that they're thinking about uh, in this particular world. You mentioned stats and and just digging into stats. When you and I worked together, it was not at the your your stats like deep dives were not at the level of what you do right now. How did how did you get into becoming kind of known as the scat, the stats guy? Like what what drove you there? Even before all this happened, man. Yeah, well, I think I just got you know sometimes you see people. Um, I read a book recently about how. Bill Gates became a super billionaire, but he also came along at the right time, right? When he understood all these things that were happening right at the moment when that came about and it exploded, you know what I mean? Like it was the right opportunity met the right time. And for me, you know, when I was working with stats back in Emporia or whatever, you know, there were no advanced basketball stats. I wasn't doing <laughs> effective field goal percentage for Emporia State Hornets, you know, that, that sort of thing. But it was starting to take off in baseball. And then right at that time, a lot more things were coming out on the internet. So I've always had an interest in numbers. Uh, um, you know, my dad was a math teacher. I always joke about that all the time. I talk about how um, there were certain trick or treaters that came by on Halloween that would get rulers from us, um, <laughs> you know, because my dad was, uh, was handing those out instead of candy. So, uh, you know, I've kind of come from a little bit of a math background, but I, I think again, telling stories from a different angle and, and seeing a different way. I, I know there's been, a lot of times maybe in the past that um, sports writers sort of it's been difficult to find your own niche because it, there's always sort of been that, Hey, these coaches understand what they're doing and they do understand what they're doing. But this sort of gave me a different Avenue to say, Hey, why don't we look at the game from this perspective? Why, why don't we look at it from this that maybe um, the coaches aren't as familiar with or don't know as much about and, and give a little bit of a unique aspect to my coverage. So like I said, I mean, that came along, you know, right in the early 2000s when the sites like Ken Pomeroy and uh, Basketball Reference and now there's Hoop Math, now there's Synergy Sports, which does a bunch of um, play and video analysis. But uh, all that kind of came along at the right time for me uh, to kind of tinker with that stuff, get more comfortable with it and then feel like I could move forward and use that in some of my writing. So, yeah, it's worked out really well. Like I said, it's it kind of goes back to the original thought, which is trying to make yourself stand out and also not make yourself completely beholden to only talking with people. Um, it gives you a way to tell different stories that a lot of people aren't hearing about um, out there just because you can do something that a lot of people aren't really familiar with. Dig into that a little bit. Why is it so uh, you know important as a sports writer to, to separate yourself uh, – I assume, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but just for you, how do you view that, that desire to kind of break away from, from the norm, I guess? Yeah. I mean, I think I can go both ways. Um, I I think just as an individual trying to break out is just sort of, (laughs) I mean, it's, it's trying to do something other people don't do. And I think that's what people more and more are gravitating towards. If you look at our, it used to be, when you wanted some sort of content, you would go to ESPN.com every day, or you'd get your newspaper every day. And it, it you know, what was in there was in there. Um, but now it's just so different with our world because people are only going to read the stuff that they really want to read, you know, like whether it's through Twitter or Facebook or, Hey, I know this guy, I, I like what he does. Um, th- this for people that aren't familiar with sports, you know, that the standard game story is sort of going away now just because yeah. people have the internet they can watch the games they can formulate their own thoughts every game is on television so i think more and more it's our job to give a different sort of analysis a different sort of viewpoint that makes us worth reading and especially now um, i know at the kansas City star what we've done is we're going now to subscription-based model and trying to get people to pay money for our content and you know i feel like you have to do something to get people to buy your stuff to, to make it worth their time. And, you know, we're not charging an arm and a leg, but if you can read in the Kansas city star, what you can read in an AP recap, what you can read at the Lawrence journal world, then why are you going to subscribe to us? And so um, I think the the stats part of that, that is part of it. I mean, I've gotten into a lot more into play breakdowns lately and trying to learn the X's of the game as much as I can, which um, part of this to me too, is just um, 
uh, is what fascinates me as well. And I think, you know, a lot of people will talk about this, but if you wake up in the morning and it's something you're curious about, and we can talk about this with interviews too. I mean, being just being naturally curious about stuff, I think it's a really good way to go. Um, and so I've been naturally curious about the stats. I've been naturally curious about kind of learning more about diving into the X's of the game and, and what's supposed to happen for KU basketball plays, even if it's not always what does happen. And maybe, again, giving readers a glance into what is going on a step below. I remember one of my favorite guys, um, Jeff Sullivan for Fangraphs, he was writing this stuff. And I, I mean, it, it was about five or six years ago, and it just was blowing my mind. I mean, you would watch a game, a, you know, watch the Royals playoff game. And okay, Gerard Dyson steals third base. Great. It's a big play in the game. Anybody can write that he stole third base. Jeff Sullivan, the next day from Fangraphs, came out and read like picture by picture, frame by frame, talked about, hey, here's how he read the pitcher. Here's what he saw with the pitcher. Here's here's the tell from the pitcher. Um, the thing he did with his shoulder that Dyson saw that immediately led him back to the base so he wouldn't get picked off. And then he saw this other thing with him that he immediately took off the third. I mean, I was just, it was like my mind was blown. Like, wow, it's... Um, going back in the day, um, like the Paul Harvey rest of the story, like, like, <laughs> like he gave the rest of the story with that sort of uh, minor play. So, I mean, that again, that just sort of blew my mind with what was happening. And so, um, yeah, I, I, when I saw that, I loved it. And I, I love doing that sort of stuff that maybe you can just give another glimpse, another level deeper. Uh, just give them the rest of the story. And that's the sort of stuff. If you can provide that to readers, then I'm hoping that they'll subscribe and I'm hoping they'll come back. So you cover one of the blue blood NCAA basketball, college basketball programs in the country in the University of Kansas. And you mentioned earlier, you know, readers want to read what they want to read about. And for fans, they want to read all the positive, glowing stuff. <laughs> and I'm sure it's it's no different anywhere else, whether you're a blue blood basketball program or not. But what you just said there the rest of the story, a lot of times the rest of the story involves details that maybe a lot of fans don't <laughs> want to turn a blind eye to. How do you, when you're covering a program of that caliber with that amount of eyes and attention on it, how do you balance or what's your process, man, of, of balancing, like I need to do my job while also attracting paying customers. I mean, it's a different world for journalists, isn't it? Yes. And I think that you've hit on something really important and really critical. And you do have these kind of two masters that you're trying to serve. And I also think that um, with the new rise of the athletic, I think that that is sort of a really fascinating subplot because I think yeah. what you're talking about, I'm not saying the athletic doesn't break news. They have a lot of people that do break news and that don't come up with these really difficult stories that are well-researched because a lot of them do. But I do think overall what you're talking about with the athletic is a lot of that is more catered to what you're speaking about, which is the home team, you know, more um, coverage that is things that fans are going to want to read that makes them feel good <laughs> so that they subscribe. And that's different from the role of a traditional newspaper. Now, listen, traditional newspapers, <laughs> a lot of them have been in trouble lately and it's difficult to get funding and it's difficult to have people pay for you. So yes, um, when I'm going out there and saying, Hey, get our sports pass, you know, pay 30 bucks a year, inevitably my Twitter feed will light up with, well, the Kansas City Star covered this scandal. The Kansas City Star covered this scandal. The Kansas City Star is against KU, all these sorts of things. Um, and, and so it is difficult. It is a challenge that we have to face. But at the same time, the Kansas City Star's values are based off of journalism, investigative journalism, you know, um, shining a light on power when power is, is doing things that, that perhaps are being done behind closed doors that need to be um, shown the light. So, um, it is a dual mission. It's difficult. We as newspapers have to transition to make sure that our paying customers are paying customers. Um, but yes, there is a balance to be had there because if you're biting the hand that feeds you, they're not going to feed you. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I think that is a difficult balance to try to find. I think we're still working with it. But um, in my own mind, it's part of the job. It has to be part of the job. And it's part of what the calling is as a journalist is to say, hey, if there's something that you know about, or you can research, or you can um, go find um, that needs to be shown to the public, that needs to be in the public light, that 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 um, needs to be out there. Then that's part of your job too, and that's not something that you should shirk away from. And listen, I, I understand a lot of people don't understand that part of it, and a lot of people um, I see that interact with me don't understand that that is part of the gig, but it is part of the gig. And so, yeah, I think that is a 
very delicate balance you're talking about because you are trying to bring in new subscribers. You're trying to bring in readers. You're trying to survive. Uh, yet a lot of the times, you know, you mentioned, especially with KU lately, there have been a lot of major, um, <laughs> I guess I won't say scandals, but um, a lot of major things. You know, their former football coach sued them for his $3 million buyout. It became a very public issue with depositions and all these things that we had to research. Uh, KU has five level one basketball violations, the most severe of any of the NCAA um, the violations and they're headed for a landmark case coming up here in the next few months. So um, all those things have to be reported on. And again, um, that's going to be read by some as, Hey, you're, you're reporting on the things that need to be reported on. And it's going to be thought of by others as you're picking on the school that you want me to, to subscribe to you to uh, have the coverage of. But um, the bottom line is that is what we do as journalists. That is what the Kansas City Star has done for 120 or whatever years it is. Um, and that's not something we're going to shirk away from because of our particular mission. Uh, it does make it difficult to sell subscriptions sometimes, but that's just the way it's going to have to be. How does that affect how you go into an interview, especially in those tense situations where you're reporting on a, a former football coach suing the school or you're reporting on, you know, violations in the basketball program. And, you know, these are obviously guys who are, are a lot of times guys and, and men and women who are fighting for their jobs and, and don't want to say too much. Like, how do you approach as a journalist asking questions, uh, digging into the details that you need to do your job, where at the same time you want to keep a, keep a professional relationship going? How do you, how do you approach that? Yeah, it, it can be difficult. And this is where sometimes it, it can help to have, you know, other people work with you. Like yeah. for myself, I've got um, longtime KB writer Gary Bedore on the beat with me. Um, and, you know, he's well respected and professional. I also, um, Steve Vockrout from the news side, um, he also has helped me with a lot of these stories. But um, that is a difficult thing to balance. I, I think what you said is exactly how it has to be, though, is keeping it professional and the way I think I always have to think about this is, I mean, so these stories break and you have to try to get comment from, you know, whoever it is, whether it's KU side, KU's, you know, PR, KU athletics, PR person, the athletic director, the men's basketball coach, the football coach, whatever the case may be. And I mean, we have contacts for all those people, obviously, but I mean, I think the way I look at this is in my own mind, the irresponsible thing to do and the thing that, again, would not meet our journalistic standards would be to not contact that person. So, yes, it's a difficult conversation. Yes, it's not something that I'm calling up the phone and, and ready with glee to, uh, to to pick up on the line. And, yes, um, there's a potential right after you have your story come out that there's another call for you uh, from one of these people. And they are yelling at you and and screaming at you. Again, part of the job. But I think my thought is it is irresponsible if I do not call that person. And do not get the comment from them. And so you keep it respectful. You keep it professional. And a lot of times, those are the sorts of things I kind of fall back upon, which is basically to say, hey, this is what we have. This is the information we have. I have to call you to see if you want to comment on this or to ask uh, whatever particular question that we have. And again, I think we do a good job at the star of consultation with this, whether it's uh, with uh, my editors or again with Steve Akrat, uh, who I work with on a lot of these pieces. But uh, you collaborate, you figure out exactly what needs to be asked, and then you make the difficult phone calls. But I think the main thing um, is what I respect is hopefully these people get back with you or answer your phone calls, especially in a sort of a public relations setting, because that is, that's what you want. And they're not always going to like what you hear, and they're not always going to like what you write. But um, if they pick up your phone call and they respect you, um, that is the number one thing. And, um, you know, I go back like Jim Marcioni, longtime KUPR director. Um, for KU Athletics. I just really respect about him. Again, there'd be times where he would be upset. There'd be times where, uh, you know, he wouldn't agree with what we were writing. But uh, I think it's really important to have a relationship with that person and have them answer your phone calls. And again, be respectful on both sides because uh, it might be a difficult conversation, but you owe it to them to get a comment because a, a lot of these stories are, are very important and uh, they're very important to a lot of parties. So I, I think you just try to you, you mentioned it. You keep it professional. You make the difficult phone calls. Uh, you know, sometimes there are going to be difficult phone calls, but that goes with the job. How do you approach a situation, especially like you just talked about uh, earlier when, you know, you may be getting on a Zoom call or you only have five minutes with somebody and it's a it's either a tense conversation or they have somewhere to be and you've got a story to write and you need the details that that you want, especially for you as like a stats guy and somebody who wants to dig a little bit deeper in your writing. 
where do you go with your interview? How do you quickly get there and and get past the pleasantries or the canned answers and get to that follow up? Yeah, it's difficult. And what you're mentioning is these quick interviews. I mean, that is almost all of what we do nowadays. <laughs> you know, even um, back in the day, Mike, when you and I used to work together again back in Emporia, Kansas. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, <laughs> Man, you know, I just like to think about kind of like the glory days, you know, like if you wanted to go talk to Ed Noon in the running back for an hour <laughs> and write the greatest feature you've ever written, you can go do it, man. Like that would be yeah. awesome. Like even now, like if I want to do a profile on a player and I got something set up one on one, it's like, OK, uh, yeah, we'll set it up three weeks in advance. You're going to be in the uh, sports information director's office with them listening as you're talking you have 25 minutes exactly, and when you show up, the opposing paper's beat writer is going to leave the office before you because they just had an interview with the same person. So, like, I mean, this is, you know, even, even those, like, set up, like, oh, yes, I'm going to get some great stuff. Like, that's the situation uh, you're in now with, uh, with what's happening in today's world. But, um, yeah, I mean, again, it depends on the situation. Uh, you, you mentioned something um, that happens a lot, which is, uh, you know, so – Here's an example. I, a, a few months ago or about a month ago, KU, that, that NCAA case we were talking about, the 501 violations, and it was announced that KU was going to be sent to this new independent panel. And I got an email from the NCAA and a PR person basically saying, hey, we will have the NCAA's main person talk to you on this um, if you want to get some, uh, to, you know, to clarify any questions that you have. I said, okay, great. What time is she available? And they said, how about in 30 minutes? And I had a radio to do um, <laughs> for the next 20 minutes. So it's exactly the same thing. So, you know, you get on the call and the NCAA people are like, okay, well, um, you know, we have this person for you and, and they're making time for you, all this stuff. But, you know, I didn't have three hours to prepare questions. You just kind of kind of go with it. So, yeah, you prepare yourself as much as you can, um, obviously, but uh, you do just sort of jot down some notes. You get to the heart of the matter and you listen. Um, you obviously do listen to what they say. And I, I know that, um, so much of this is stuff kind of you learn over time, but, um, I think we all fall into the, it, maybe it's, maybe it's a trap, but I remember the first times that I would do interviews with somebody and do a profile, I would have a whole notebook of questions and I'm going to ask every single one of these questions and that is going to be it. Um, but over time, the best questions you have are the ones where you're listening and somebody says something. And again, you're naturally curious and you say, wait a minute what did you just say? Like, what did you, did you talk about a story that, that really affected you back in the day? Did, did, did you say that, what, why is your car so important to you or, 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 or what happened with your dad? And, you know, that sort of thing. And so, um, again, that doesn't apply obviously to the NCAA spokesperson <laughs> necessarily, <laughs> but, um, a lot of times you just gotta have to, you have, you're gonna have to listen and you're gonna have to figure it out. And, um, yeah, there's just certain small things, uh, you learn over time that, that, that you get going. I mean, I remember, with her in particular, what's kind of crazy, and this one doesn't always land, and it doesn't always work, but sometimes it does. Um, this is an old trick from back in the book. From back in the book, Mike, um, when I was talking to the NCAA uh, spokesperson, I got to the end and I just said, "I really appreciate your time. Thanks for talking to me. Is there anything else that you think people should want to know about this?" And she kind of stops. She goes, "Well, that's an interesting question." She goes, um, "Probably the most important thing is that this is." Um, kind of a, a, a line in the sand sort of moment in this case that everybody knows where it's going to go from now. <laughs> I remember that was my lead quote. You know, I, I, I had talked to her for 15 minutes. I had all these great questions lined up. And then at the end, I said, you know, is, is there something that, that you think is important to know? And so, yeah, there's, there's certain little tricks in the book um, that you can use and pull out at certain times. And uh, I'm not saying to not prepare because preparing is great and you want to get as much information as you can on the person that you're talking to beforehand because it can lead you in certain directions or um, it, it eliminates the need for you to spend five minutes talking about something that you should have already known um, and can move on from that or do research on that. But um, there also are some times where you can, um, you know, throw the line in the water and, and see what, what you can reel in. And uh, sometimes you get a little bit lucky with that, but otherwise you're just listening and trying to pick up on, on some cues and figuring out uh, exactly uh, where this story might lead. You've got the added, I guess, layer <laughs> of the fact that you are reporting on Kansas athletics as a University of Kansas alum. And I've seen from afar watching on Twitter and, and all this following you for, for years now, 
you get the pe- you get both sides. You get the people who think you're just a mouthpiece for KU, and usually it's the the K State fans, and you've got the <laughs> and the Missouri fans, and you've got the people that uh, you know are fans of the university who want you to be a a mouthpiece or expect you to be a mouthpiece as an alum. I guess the question is, in that is like, what does that do for you personally? Like, how do you how do you just let that go? When you get when you get it from both sides, <laughs> yeah, um, it is funny. It, it is, you know, maybe I'm looking at it the wrong way. I think the fact that that happens, I see as a positive, honestly, because if if the KSA fans really think I'm the biggest homer in the world, and the KU fans think that I hey, every time there's a negative story on KU, I get the responses like, well, it's a negative story i know who wrote it it's jesse newell you know what i mean like that that's the guy um you're probably doing something right i guess because um you're you're obviously giving praise when uh the team deserves it and then you're obviously um reporting on the things that are not so good and um doing the due diligence there so yeah it's i'm gonna say you said it's the added benefit i i don't think it's an added benefit (laughs) i think it makes my job a lot tougher I, i would rather be uh nebraska alum covering kansas i'd rather be a whoever you know just some random school south florida or something i think that would make everything a lot easier because you're right there is that inclination to um obviously put the stereotype on me um, one way or the other and, and listen i understand it i i think there are writers out there that obviously they do cater to their own school and it's difficult in today's media landscape because you have some sites that are like rivals.com and 24 7 sports some do really really good work really good reporting work and some of them are basically fan sites. And, and listen, I get some of the relationship there because to get recruiting news, you have to be close to the coaches. To be close to the coaches, you can't make them mad. And so, again, that's one of the things I sort of have the luxury of is that, I mean, I, I don't have to worry about making the coaches mad. And, and I don't worry about making coaches mad because my job is to report, my job is to investigate, my job is to be a journalist. I understand that it's a different role for some of these recruiting sites, but it is difficult to kind of parse through that if you're a fan and understand the difference between national 24 seven sports writer, local 24 seven sports writer and Kansas city star writer. I mean, all those kind of have different layers to them. And, and obviously, uh, you know, this Mike, I mean, for like for K-State, for example, like go power cat was kind of the standard bearer for K-State coverage. And that was a, a recruiting site. And so they were doing a lot more serious work than a lot of the other papers out there. And yet, um, you know, you could look at other sites that are in those networks and they weren't doing that same sort of work. So it's, it's very difficult to parse through that, um, I think. But uh, yeah, I, I, you, you do what you do and, and you got to just come to grips with, you just, you do it. <laughs> you know, you, you, you do your job, you do it to the best of your ability. To say that none of us have biases is absolutely incorrect. But um, the thing is, I, it, Sam Mellinger, our columnist for the Star, talks about this all the time. And I, I don't think people understand it really. And it is difficult to explain. And I'm sure um, you sort of get it, Mike, but it changes. I mean, I, I am not a Kansas fan. Like that is not any part of my being. Like, you know, it's just not. I, I cover Kansas. I mean, if they win, great if there's a good story. If they lose, great if there's a good story. It's just so different. And it's so different from what I think people think that it is. And again, sometimes that's difficult um, to figure out as well because we have other writers. Bill Simmons, you know, he made his whole career from being a Boston sports fan. You know what I mean? So that's different. And, and that provides analysis. But um, you just have to be true to, to what you think is is right out there. So um, again, K State people are not going to believe that I'm not a homer. Um, they're not going to believe, uh, you know, what I am a fan of, obviously, is the stats and the numbers. And I, sometimes I am beholden to them, especially when it comes to my AP poll vote, which um, a lot of people uh, look at. And it's a lot different from other what other people do. But Ooh, you, can, um, you, you just, take some you, heat for that, man. Oh, my gosh. Every week. Uh, <laughs> every single week. Absolutely. But um, yeah, it, it is sort of interesting to see the uh, responses out there. But Again, you're the one that has to have the, the head hit the pillow at night. And uh, again, all I can promise you is that at this point in my life, I am definitely not a Kansas fan. And uh, if you're making both sides wonder about you, then you're probably doing something right. So I want to I want to think back. You know, you've been at the Emporia Gazette where you and I started. You've been at the Lawrence Journal World. You've been at the Topeka Capital Journal. You, you're not the star. What has been what's been the interview that you've done? going all the way back, if you can think of one, 
where during their interview, you knew I've got, I've got a good story here. Like this is going to be, this is going to be one of the best ones to write. That's a good question. Um, I can think of a couple, you know, it was interesting. One of them I'm thinking of is Emporia state, uh, which I think I know uh, where you're going to go with this one. <laughs> do you? Okay. Well, that's, that's great. If you do, I, I, I'm not sure you do, but maybe you do. Um, it, it always, so you talk about the, the interviewing process and what you're trying to do uh, so much of it. And, and this is, this is a real challenge. Uh, we know how the media is viewed nowadays and a lot of it, honestly, rightfully so. I mean, a lot of times the things that are done out there, uh, I wonder why people talk to us. And, and that's the thing with big feature stories is like to get someone to talk to you openly and honestly about their lives. It is such, it's an honor, but it's such a challenge. And um, to get somebody to do that, you, you're using everything in your toolbox. You're using everything to get them to let the guard down and let them trust you and tell them, have them tell you the story of their life. So um, one I can think back to is uh, Emporia State, they actually were playing in the softball championship and it was April Huddleston who ended up um, being one of their shortstop. But anyway, she was talking about her, her father and every, before every at bat, she drew her father's um, racing number in the batter's box with her bat handle. But it was interesting. So I had asked the sports formation director, Don Weiss to talk to her. And I still remember we were in like, the embassy suites in Houston during the uh, college world series or whatever, but we'd done this interview and, you know, normally, again, I just talked about the interviews. Okay. You're in the sports and restaurant information director's office. You're sitting with the person, but there's another person there. I mean, it's not quite like that. I still remember we, we talked and it's like a, in the hallway and like backs up against a wall and just like, I had my recorder, but just kind of sitting on the floor and we were just kind of talking, you know, sitting, talking and like, oh, we were about the same age. Cause I was just out of college but I remember even Don mentioned it afterwards because um, he just said that was one of the best interviews I've ever seen just because like, it was like, I kind of like had my head on my hand and was just kind of looking over it and I go, okay, so tell me about that. And, and I'm, it, it wasn't like I was, I really was interested, but again, it was such an informal setting. I think it allowed her to talk openly. It was not stiff. It wasn't like we're in this, what's he trying to get at? What's, what's he trying to do? And it's just, it was just a natural conversation. And it's just exactly what you're trying to do. You're trying to get people to trust you and open up to you. And it was just kind of the perfect setting for it. And, and it was allowed because, you know, Emporia State might not have the same media guidelines as everybody else. But I remember him, him even saying that to me afterwards, like that was, that was really smart. That was really good because you could just tell you guys were just talking and, and, and that there was just this conversation going on. So, um, that was a good one. Um, I think a few years back at the star, one of the first ones I had was Devonte Graham and he spoke about, you know, his, that's, that one's a difficult one because his mom had him when she was 14. So obviously it's a very sensitive topic, but yet it's a major part of his story. Um, so, you, you know, you talk to him, you, you try to think about beforehand how you want to word things and, and how to get people, because it is an uncomfortable conversation. It is difficult, something to bring up and it's something somebody could immediately shut down, um, if they don't feel comfortable talking to you. So, um, that's another thing. If you know, you have 20 minutes, a lot of times the first five to me, you're not trying to waste time, but, but you're trying to give, you're trying to put monotone. You're trying to get them to loosen up, open up. I'm not going to come right out of Devonta Graham and say, Hey, so I heard the, your mom gave birth to you when you were 14. Can you, can you go, <laughs> can you go over those details right away? I mean, you haven't developed any rapport. You haven't developed any trust. So usually those were a little bit further down my notebook. You start to get them to talk. You start to get them to, to speak with you. And then that's when, um, when you built up a little bit of rapport, again, I'd rather have 35 minutes than 20 minutes, but if you have 20 then you got to try to do what you can do. But um, that one, another one, with Jeff Withy, I think went really well. He talked about his, his grandma passing. There was an interesting story with that and how he paid tribute to her. Um, those are the ones immediately that come to mind, but, uh, yeah, we, you're trying to get people, um, to, to, to deal with you again, to, to, to drop all the media stuff, to drop all the newspaper stuff, and then just to trust you because you're the one that's going to be entrusted with their story when it comes forward. And, um, if they, if you can get that from them, if they can trust you, the person with what, 
um, you know, you're about to, to report or write or go forward with, then I think that's the real key. And that's when you get the good stories. That's when you get uh, people talking to you about topics that they don't talk to many people about. So um, yeah, it's, it's skills you develop over time. You can become more comfortable as it goes on. It's greater if you, it's great if you have better access, but um, otherwise you do your research, you get in there, you listen, and then uh, you try to get as much as you can. So what was the story with April Huddleston, the pitcher? Uh, why did she draw her dad's racing number in the, the dirt before her at-bats? Yeah, so again, we're going way back, so we're going over a decade. And actually, <laughs> it's very interesting. She is the uh, softball coach for Emporia State right now. Is she really? So, okay. Yeah, so it's it's pretty cool that uh, she's gone on. And um, she actually, you know, this is going way far back, but they played in the national championship game. She hit a ball down the line that would have been a game-winning home run in the sixth inning or potential game-winning home run. And the umpire called it foul and the foul poles were like six feet tall at the national championship. And <laughs> if you go back on the video replay, I'm convinced if that foul pole was 12 feet tall, like it should be in a championship event, it would hit the foul pole and they would have, they would have won the game. So kind of crazy. They ended up losing the national championship game by one run. But um, so anyway, the story was basically that her dad loved racing. He loved doing it. Seven um, X was the number that he raced with. Um, but as he grew older and, and say, I, they had her and basically had more financial responsibilities that he gave up racing to try to fully support her. And so then he had died at an earlier age and, um, her way to commemorate and honor him was to do that number because he had basically sacrificed what he loved and everything that he did for her. And so he was, she was going to show her appreciation back for all that he had done for her. Um, so anyway, kind of a, a cool thing and yeah. it was the right timing with it, obviously with the national championship game coming up and everything like that. But, um, those are the sorts of things, the sorts of details that, Hey, is she doing something before it bad? Why, what is she drawn in the, in the batter's box? You know, th- those sorts of things are, can potentially make great anecdotes if you can get at them and get someone to trust you, um, to tell their story and, and to hear their story. And, um, from there, you know, it's sort of, um, interesting. I, you continually try to improve, you know, I, I printed off things, how to interview, you know, there's people have with certain tips. Um, you, you try to continue to get better. I hope I can continue to get better because right now, again, with COVID and everything that's going on, who knows how everybody's roles are going to change. But um, one thing I was really excited to do is I signed up for masterclass and uh, I don't know if you've heard of Chris Voss, oh, yes. who is the art of negotiation. negotiation. Yes, sir. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I don't know if you've heard his stuff, but like, I just kind of became, I mean, you're talking to a guy that, when I get on something, get curious and fascinated, that's really when I'm in my wheelhouse. But I, I watched his whole masterclass and it is amazing. I would encourage anybody to either go, I haven't read his book, but I'm sure it's great too. It's fantastic. I, it's I, so some, good. <laughs> some, some of those techniques, it's, it's amazing because he was saying, try this and see if it works for you. And I was like, there is no way <laughs> that these things he's saying, mirroring is going to work. And I kid you not, that day I went to three different people and <laughs> it worked with all of them. And so like a quick tip is, um, again, Michael, if you've read his book, you know this, but mirroring, I, I can't wait to use mirroring. I mean, this is this thing. It's like, I can't believe it worked. Um, but it's, so if somebody says something to you, uh, you know, they say, yeah, I was going to the grocery store and, uh, you know, it, it was all great except, you know, um, for this weird thing that happened to the checkout counter. And so you, showed, you, know, you say to him, weird thing at the checkout counter and it's a, so i'm thinking there's no way somebody's gonna respond sure enough they go oh yeah yeah so, so, yeah somebody came up to me and uh they asked me if i had 20 bucks i could lend it to them and then you go 20 bucks <laughs> and they go well yeah it's 20 bucks they said that they had no gas in their car and they're going to walk two miles down the road uh to be able to fill up their uh their car but but they said they just didn't have the money they didn't have the money and you ask in a questioning voice and it's amazing. People respond to you and they also love it because you are generally interested in what they're saying and you're listening to what they're saying. And so, uh, like I said, I mean, I don't often have these long interviews that can be able to put this in complete use, but like, I can't wait because it's like <laughs> this guy, uh, I was just using it in normal conversation. Again, you're trying to build skills. You're trying to continue to do those sorts of things. But even that one small thing, um, I, was, I was so skeptical. I was like, there's no way that my wife, my brother, my dad uh, is going to fall for this thing. But oh my goodness, like that day I did it, it worked with every single person. And uh, again, kind of going to build that trust, build that rapport, that sort of thing. It's amazing how many stories people want to tell you 
if you seem interested and are actually listening to them and repeating back to them what they're saying and also saying, hey, I am curious to learn more about your story, people want to tell you their stories. What about when somebody shuts you down? What about when you know you just get into an interview situation and they they clam up or they don't want to talk to you? You know, we've all been there as as interviewers. What is how do you how do you push through that? It's a good question, um, and there's a couple different things you can do. I, I think the number one thing you do is you try to reroute. You try to find some common ground. You try to find something that they do want to talk about. And again, um, a lot of the shutdown basically is I'm not reaching that level of, of rapport needed to get those details. Um, so you try a different method. And again, I think you listen to what they are interested in and you're trying to get them back, even if it's not something, again, for us, we're writing stories, you know, we obviously know what we probably are going to write, but if you have to go backtrack and get to something to get them talking about something they're interested in or something that they like to talk about, then that's something you do. Um, I, I think the other thing, uh, if it just completely gets shut down is, there's always someone else to talk to and there's always another angle and there's, and uh, again, I think it's important for storytellers especially is to not get yourself completely locked and laser focused on, Hey, I did research. This is what I'm going to write. Absolutely. What I'm going to write. A lot of times it is, and you figure out the fascinating thing, but sometimes it's not. And sometimes you find different things outside of that realm. So um, you can't just pitch in yourself, pigeonhole yourself into that one particular area and you can't just, stop with one particular interview. If, if that's where it is, there's always one more person to call uh, to see if there's, there's more to the story. So um, yeah, I think you try to, to go a different route and redirect and see if you can come back later to a similar topic with a, a differently worded question and, and maybe said in a different way. Um, but if not, then uh, you, you basically are, are trying to get something out of that interview and then uh, moving on from there and, and trying different methods after that. Where do you think you've Where do you think you've improved the most as an interviewer in your time as a journalist? Do you think back when you started at KU as a journalism student, <laughs> how your interviews were then versus how you handle them now? What's different? What's improved? Yeah, I think a lot of this is just you learn over experience and you become better. Yeah, I think the number one thing is trying to figure out what your purpose is and moving towards that purpose. Because I think earlier on, I was really interested in, especially, you know, when you're talking to Bill Self, or you're talking to Les Miles, or you're talking to athletic directors, there's part of you that just really wants to sound smart. You know, you just want to be perceived as somebody who's smart. And the problem with that is I would ask these questions that were really long and really made me sound super smart. And I understand this. I understand that. And what would happen? I would get crummy answers. Um, I would get yes, no answers. Uh, so it's, it's, it, here's an example. I, 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 I probably, I don't know if I should share this or not, but <laughs> so Bill Self has worked at Kansas for, this will be his 18th year coming up. Okay. And, you know, I've actually read in books about certain people, certain personality types, but um, Bill Self, again, I've, I've been covering him for a long time. You know, he took the job when I was in college, even when I was writing a little bit for Topeka and the Kansan and, uh, you, you know, the university paper, all those sorts of things. But over time, you start to figure out what gets the best responses from Bill Self. Okay. So I think earlier in my career, I would say to Bill Self, well, Bill, your defensive rebounding has been down this year compared to years past. And, um, you know, it seems like you're, you know, it might be because your guys are a little bit shorter than normal and, and maybe they're not given as much effort. Um, but is that something you think is happening? And again, I sound smart. I did some research, but it's going to get a crummy answer. I mean, the answer is going to be no, I don't think that. Okay, well, what did I do? I spent an hour beforehand preparing this question, getting my ducks in a row, making sure that Bill Self saw how smart I was, and I got no answer that could be used in my story. Okay, what I've learned over time, especially with Bill Self, is open-ended, simple. Let him tell you what he knows. Okay, <laughs> don't come out with your opinion. Don't come at it with your angle, because he, very much so, 
because he should, as a Hall of Fame coach, will tell you where you are wrong. Um, it's sort of like, uh, what is what is the show on TV? Help me out. Uh, you got to help me out. The Mark Cuban show um, Shark where Tank. people pitch stuff. Shark Tank. What is it? Shark Tank. Shark Tank. Yeah. Okay. Shark Tank. People come on that show and they say, hey, here's, here's my, why my product's great. Here's why it's great. Here's why it's great. What's the first thing those people do back to them? They say, hey, here's why it's not. What about this question? What about this question? What about this question? Because that's how those people work. That's how the top of the top leaders work. They're trying to figure out why this will not work, okay? That's how their whole lives are. And so sometimes when you come at it and you say, hey, here's why my product is not going to work. And here's what keeps me up at night. And here's why I, here's what the challenges I see in the next three years. And it kind of flips on those people and they go, I like this person because they're thinking the way that I think. You know what I mean? They're not telling me how great their product is. They're telling me, hey, these are the these are the things that are the challenges. And that's how I think. So it's very similar because Bill Self is that sort of mind. It's very similar to Bill Self. He doesn't, if you tell him something, <laughs> he is going to tell you why what you said is not right because he's smart. And, and <laughs> what you said is probably not right. So you keep it simple because for me, it doesn't matter the question I ask. It doesn't matter how smart I am. It, what matters is that I get him talking about the subject that I need him to talk about. And so it might be the most basic of questions sometimes. It might be, sounds simple. It might sound like, what is this beat reporter doing basically going on and just giving this simple, simple question? But sometimes that's what's needed to get the best answer. So sometimes with Bill Self, the best question is simply, what did you think about your team's defensive rebounding? What did you think about, again, that's not the most pro way to do things, but it's the best way to get the best answer. And so um, you are asking him a simple question. And so many times the response back from him, I remember the Villanova game this last year, um, you know, KU was up for a lot of the game, up six late, blew the lead in the last two minutes. Um, and again, in certain questions, he's grumpy, whatever, you know, not getting great responses. And I just said to him, I said, what did you think of your late game execution? Well, it sucked. It was terrible. I mean, blew this, blew that, did this wrong, did that wrong, and gives this whole answer, which I basically use in my entire story. But again, the, well, you know, the late game execution sucked. Came, the quote came because I didn't say, well, it seemed like your late game execution sucked. Because <laughs> what answer would he have given then? Yeah. Well, yeah, you think so? Yeah. So it's letting him tell me. You tell me because I'm trying to get information from you. I'm trying to get you to speak to me, and again, for us in newspapers, trying to get a quote um, that that goes well with the story or some analysis that goes with the story. So I think that's what I've learned most over time is that this whole thing is not about me. It's not about being smart. It's not about impressing my friends. It's about getting good material for my stories. And uh, if that means that I have to do things that are um, seen as different from other people or <laughs> this, things that are, um, you know, if people think less of me, that's fine. As long as I'm doing my job and getting the stuff that I need to get, uh, that that's, what's most important. Well, man, this has been awesome. Uh, you know, just connecting with you again. And, uh, it's been so long since we talked, we texted a few times, I think in, in the last few years, but man, it's good to, good to connect with you again. And, uh, you know, I guess I'll ask this, like, are we going to have sports this fall? I mean, by the time this could come out, it's all going to change, but what do you think? Are we going to have sports this fall? <laughs> yeah, it all could change. Uh, <laughs> I, obviously I, I think if you're looking at the grand, the big landscape of things, uh, overall, it, it seems like pro sports are much more viable because they have unions and they have financial reasons to do this sort of thing. Uh, college sports, Again, I, I don't have the crystal ball or I, I didn't purchase one on Amazon yet, but uh, it sure seems difficult. Yeah. And I would expect them to, to kick it to the spring here pretty soon. Again, this, this could be bad cold takes exposed here very soon uh, <laughs> if they do actually play a season. But it sure seems pretty difficult and almost unfeasible to do this thing, especially when you're talking about football. Uh, in a setting where you can't bubble the athletes, you know, you can't, you have different testing and I know they're trying to unify testing now, but you have different schools that can test more and different schools that can test less. And potentially you have, um, let's say your offensive line gets it and the whole meeting room gets it. So all of a sudden you have 15 guys that are out for three weeks, you know, what do you do? Um, that sort of thing. So yeah, it's, it's difficult. And, um, obviously for a college beat writer, it's difficult to, to wonder what's going to happen with the next few months and maybe even the next few years. But I think we'll see pro sports. Um, I, I, I think, Obviously, some things could stop that and, and some things could say, hey, um, you know, if there's a, a very high profile death or something that happens, then potentially um, that might not be a good case scenario. But 
Um, I think they're at least going to start and we'll see if they finish, but college sports, it's going to be a lot more difficult. I, I think the world needs to see Patrick Mahomes play again. So, Oh my gosh. I think... <laughs> <laughs> get, get those face shields if you need them because right? uh, yeah, whatever that takes is, is what it's going to take. Hey man, uh, I'll throw it back on you. What did I not ask? What, what should, what should I have asked? What do you want to leave people with? I think you covered it pretty well. I'm, I'm probably going to be the person that the 90% that doesn't give you a very good answer to that last question, even though, uh, you know, you throw the water in the line. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> it's like anything else. I, I, it's, it's a developed skill over time. We become good at what we practice. I, I just think in any spot in life, and this goes for interviewing, but I, I just think natural curiosity is so important. I, I think you just have to find, and, and then that's why, for a while for me, that was absolutely the stats. And I, I still love the stats, but then, you know, for a while I thought, gosh, these plays, there's a lot that goes into them and they're just simple basketball plays. There's only five people, but look, they're doing this behind the scenes to make this happen. That's really, and oh my gosh, Bill Self sold a play from Europe. How did that happen? You know, like, I, and those are the sorts of things. Um, I, again, I think that's really transferable. And I think that's important in interviews too. It's just, always being naturally curious and, and that's going to lead you to a very good place, whether it's, you know, through your job and learning a new skill or through interviewing and learning more about that person. Uh, but, but just, I, I think that natural curiosity will get you a long way and, um, and finding spots where that really can resonate because uh, that's, I, I think that's led me to a lot of good places just because that's, that's the stuff that, Hey, I'm, even in my spare time, uh, I, I'm, I, I just want to consume this information. I want to learn more about it. I, I, it's sort of like you have a little bit of list on the side and you say, what, if I have free time, what am I going to do? What, what, what skill do I want to have? What, what do I want to learn about? Um, and if you can approach interviews and, and life in that way and find those things that really make you tick, I, I think you're going to end up in a good spot, uh, whether it's for an interview, for a story, for, uh, a job, for what you're doing. And again, all of life is not that. All life is not rainbows and butterflies. We all have our specific job responsibilities that have to be taken care of. But if you can merge those two, I think that that's, that's a really good spot that you can land in. Thank you so much to today's guest, Jesse Newell. Please do me and Jesse a huge favor and share this episode with someone you know who might also find value in listening to today's conversation. It's cliche in the podcasting world to ask for reviews, and I can't stand cliche questions or cliche answers. But honestly, guys, reviews do help all of your favorite podcasters, not just me, continue to do what they do and reach more people. So if you have it in your heart, please leave a rating and review of this show wherever you might be listening and share it with someone who you think might enjoy the episode as well. If you know someone who you think would be a great guest on the follow-up question or have a question you'd like me to address on a future episode, email me at michael at thefollowupquestion.com or go to thefollowupquestion.com slash contact and submit a guest recommendation or a question. If you want to improve your own ability to listen and ask questions, hop over to thefollowupquestion.com slash newsletter and subscribe. And when you do, I'll send you my free guide, the 10 follow-up questions guaranteed to keep a conversation going. You'll also be the first to know about new content and fresh tips and tricks. And that's all free when you subscribe at thefollowupquestion.com slash newsletter. I'll catch you on the next episode of The Follow-Up Question. And until next time, keep asking questions.